today we're going to do a very special menu. Big soup, rustic bread, especially bread. I want to show you how to make real French bread. And the type of soup that you enjoy when it's really cold and you sit down by the stove with a big bowl of soup, a book. This is enjoying life, you know. And we're going to start with that book, that uh, soup called a garbure. Garbure is a soup from the Béarn, uh, that is the Gascony. You know, the pays of the country of uh, Cyrano de Bergerac in the southwest of France. And the garbure, the name may even come from the, the Spanish garbia, or it may come from other things, but it usually indicates a very thick type of soup stew. And it's used for different type of soup stew. Uh, in the conventional one, of course, there is pig's feet, there is preserved goose, there is uh, sausage, there is bacon, there is ham, and so forth. In our version, of course, much leaner, I am putting only ham, and I'm doing a quantity here for like eight to 10 people. I have about one and three quarter pound of ham there, and this is a very lean ham that I'm putting in like 12 cup of water. And with that, I have half a pound of beans, those kind of navy or uh, kidney-shaped beans, you know, any type of white bean like that will work. I pick up the stone out of it. You clean it up to be sure there is no stone or anything in it, wash it, and put it to cook. Bring it to a boil. This has to cook for one hour. After an hour, it will look about like that. Then at that point, we can put the rest of our vegetable in it, some of the vegetables. As you see, the beans are practically cooked now. So what I want to do is to put vegetable. I have potato. So we have beans and potato, as you can see, it's going to be quite rich. I have uh, leek here, I have cabbage, a great deal of vegetable. It's a kind of pot au feu also that we call in France. And I have uh, carrot, celery, you can put any other type of vegetable that you have in your refrigerator. And finally, parsnip. The parsnip is that type of white carrot, which has a really very special taste and what used a great deal in the Middle Age in France and in Europe. It has a kind of revival now, a bit like a, a taste of turnips to a certain extent. This again, we cover, and now it has to cook for another hour. One hour here, one hour here. And now let's move to bread. As you can see, I have beautiful bread here that I have made. Some of them are four to five days old. And I wanted to discuss the different type of bread. You see, this one is about five days old. And the longer it takes to prove that bread, the longer I can keep it after. Uh, I want to show you the color inside. And this one that I have here is a rye bread, which will be slightly different, more of a farmer type of bread. This one is still slightly lukewarm because uh, I did it uh, this morning. But you can see the white bread. I mean, there is some, uh, some other thing in it that I'm going to discuss. And this is uh, the rye bread. When you do bread, bread is the staff of life. You have to start with the right flour. We are using here, uh, you can use a bread flour. We're using all-purpose flour. And it has to do with the amount of gluten or the amount of protein. Gluten or protein is the same thing. Well, the whole-purpose flour is between 9 to 11 percent gluten. Bread flour can go up to 15 percent gluten. The more gluten, the more elasticity that you have in it. And you need elasticity for that. Now, with this, we have water, yeast and salt. This is about the equipment that you do, I mean, the stuff that you do in a real French bread. Now, the yeast, there is different type of commercial yeast, which we are going to use, but there is also bread which is done without any yeast. Years ago, uh, before the 17th century, there was no yeast in France. And when I was a kid, I remember during the war, I was four or five years old, sent to a farm uh, in the Alps with my brother, and the bread was done every two weeks, no yeast. In one gram of yeast, commercial yeast, and one gram of yeast is 28 of an ounce, you have 10 billion yeast cells. So it's an enormous amount. In one pound of flour, you have about 10,000 yeast cells. You can, however, do bread only with water and flour. It will start fermentating. And then what you do, you add more flour and water every day. That's what we call a rafraîchi, to refresh it, to add more water, more flour, so that the yeast has something to feed on. And it will take a week like that to do bread. This is the way it used to be done many, many years ago. When we used to finish it this way, the idea was to take a piece of that dough, keep that dough in the refrigerator, 
what I mean in the, in the cellar at the time, for three, four days, or even up to a week and a half in water. And that was the starter that the bread was made of. You know. Now what we are doing is very often what is called a polish or a sponge, which is a mixture of equal portion of water and flour, a bit of yeast, and that gives a created a very bubbly, very strong yeasty mixture. And this in turn is mixed with a lot of flour and the bread are divided in this way. In what we are going to do here, it's slightly different. We're using different type of flour. I have brine here, which is just the coarse surface of the wheat. I have rye flour I have in that bread over there. I have oatmeal and I have, those are wheat berry, actually they are bulgur pre-cooked wheat berry, all that can be mixed for texture in our bread. And the yeast, granulated yeast. The lower the amount of yeast, the longer it proof, and the lower the temperature to a certain extent, the longer it's going to last. What I'm saying by this, the making of bread is dependent on all of those factors, temperature, the amount of yeast, and time. What I do here, it's a kind of dry yeast, a very easy way to do it, you see. I have a pound and a half of flour. A pound and a half of flour is three and a half, or four and a half cup of flour done this way. And in this, I can use, let's say, a little bit of uh, um, brand, those are brand here, you know, about half an ounce, even a little bit of this. You can mix it in there. Then my yeast, I put like, one teaspoon of yeast. I can go up to one tablespoon as low as half a teaspoon if I let it go longer. And approximately two and a half teaspoon of salt. Now I have a type of dry yeast. I could do that ahead. I could do that for several days. You see, I have it all ready now to do into my mixer. And this is what I'm going to show you here. I have the same amount that I have in the other one here, except I have some, uh, some, dry, uh, some uh, rye flour in there. So I put that in there, and I put two cups of water. Usually try to use good water. I have good water here, as uh, you can see. And what I'm going to do is to put that directly in there. And normally I would let that, I would let that turn on low speed or medium speed, because I have, I can with that type of machine vary my speed for about for about two, three minutes. And all I have is that here. I would remove this from that, leave it a little longer than this. And I could actually let that proof into that thing. I could put a piece of a plastic wrap on top and that would have to proof. And I will go back to the proofing. It can proof a long, long time. Second recipe that I'm doing with the one that I mix in front of you will be in the food processor and that works just as well except that if it turns faster, it will increase the temperature. I use cold water. When the dough is finished, it should not be more than 70, 75 degrees. You know? uh, so again, the same idea. And I can have that on uh, medium to low heat. And here, I think I need a little more flour. I see it a bit soft. Actually, when the dough is soft, it's not bad either. It's a bit harder to handle. You get bigger hole. You get bigger hole in the cooking of your dough. What I do here, however, you cook that for not that long, really, and we put that directly into that type of uh, plastic, you know? The other one, it would be big enough to prove, but this one, I like to use those type of plastic. Watch out not to cut your finger here. And I put that in there. And maybe a little more extra flour. I did this one a bit soft. I think I have. This is the one that I mix myself. You know what? I think I, I don't have the exact amount of flour. I should have a little more flour than that. I don't know if I measure it. I may have put three and a half cup of flour. That's what it looked like rather than four and a half cup. And that's why it's soft. But in any case, it would be a pound and a half of flour, which is four and a half cup, uh, approximately a tablespoon or two and a half teaspoon of uh, salt, one to two teaspoon of yeast. It depends again how long you're going to let it proof, and two cup of water. Uh, this, you cover it and you let it proof again, room temperature in the area of 65 to 70 degrees is a good, uh, a good average. And that, 
will prove for from six hours up to 24 hours I can leave it. And very often I have done it up to 24 hours. And this is basically what I get out of it. This has been in for about eight, nine hours. This is the first bread and you can see here the proofing of the dough. You know, the, 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 the carbon dioxide if you want, the air that develop in it, and uh, which will give you the texture and that strong yeasty taste that you have. What we are going to do here is to mold a couple of bread and what you do, I use a piece of uh, parchment paper in the bottom of the pan and you can put in the bottom, I have cornmeal, here I have uh, oatmeal, uh, and here I have farina. Any of that stuff you can put in the bottom, it will help, it will prevent the bread from sticking. In addition to that, if you put it on this, you don't dirty your pan so it's a bit better also and easier to take out. So what I have here is the first bread, which is really <coughs> stuck in there. And what you want to do, I have that wonderful smell of yeast that I can really smell here. You start from the side, you know, to bring it inside toward the center. Bring it this way and fold it on itself. You see what I'm doing actually here? I am molding my bread directly in there. Makes it even easier. I could use a little bit of flour if you think it sticks, but basically you bring, you could knead it on the table, but see the idea is to bring it from the side toward the center to establish a nice bread. And this way I have a kind of round bread. You see with the right texture, you don't want to tear the top, you want it to be smooth. We put that right on top, I press it down a little bit, and this goes directly on top of it and that's how I make it proof and that will proof like that for an hour and a half to two hours again at room temperature about 70 degree. If you do baguette, of course, smaller bread, then 45 minutes of proofing is going to be enough. See this one has the, 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 the rye in it and I can smell quite a, different, uh, quite a different smell out of it. So what we'll do here, I'll do another one and maybe in that bottom I'll put some some uh, oatmeal, you know those are crushed oatmeal. Any of this will go fine. Then again, I bring it together, together, and I can really smell, beautiful smell. Again, a bit of flour to help in this. And I could do this this way, or you know what you could do with that also? You could do what we call a couronne, that is, you make a hole in the center and you start working it from that hole into a kind of large donut this way, you know, taking a bit more time than I, than I would want to do, but basically this is the idea of extending what we call a, a couronne in France, which is a crown, you know, of bread. We mark it in different way. And basically you want it fairly large in the center so that by the time you put it on top, it's not going to join together. It's going again to proof in this way. Again, you turn it upside down, and now you let it proof for a couple of hours at room temperature. Remember, it is very important to be covered. If it's not covered, you will have a skin forming on top, and if you have a shell or a skin forming on top, the bread won't expand anymore. It has to stay moist. So this will create that type of environment where the carbon dioxide coming out of the bread create a moisture and it will be soft and, uh, and very soft as the way it should be so that it can expand properly. I don't think there is one meal for a Frenchman without bread. And whether it's we start in the morning with the café au lait and the baguette or the quatre heures, the small snack in the afternoon when the kids come from school again with a baguette, crunchy baguette and a piece of chocolate. I have here some baguette which are molded in this way and I put a piece of saran wrap on top, plastic wrap, so that it proof again under uh, something moist, you know. And what you want to do if you want to give it a shape and a look, this gives a, a country look, you just put some flour on top of it and then there is different way of shaping it. Here the classic way is to really run your knife across and I'm using a serrated edge knife. The real baker are using uh, a blade, a, um, a razor blade, you know. And then to do an AP which is the head of wheat, what you do, you cut it this way, bring that on the side, cut it, bring it on the side 
again, and you're doing like a head of wheat here. Those are all of the different type of shape that you can do with your bread, you know? Now this one here is kind of a, a different shape of all. Again, you know, I could put a bit of flour on top and you want to run your knife, again, not the point, run it on top of it, see in the center, and here that do like the leaf of a flower, you know? This will be beautiful by the time it's cooked. And finally, the one that we had here, which is the round one, that I could do in another way. I could put some, uh, some uh, oatmeal on top and even a little bit of flour on top of this. Give it another look. And finally, just mark it in the center this way. Sometimes you may even, you can see it, it's starting proofing already, starting pushing cutting the side to give it the expansion. And now, directly into the oven, you want to put it, in that case here, I'm putting it on a stone. And the advantage of doing what I did here is that I can slide this directly on the stone. And a little bit of water, one, two tablespoons, in the oven to create, that create the steam that I need to get the real crust of a French bread. And I have one here in the same way, cut about in the same way. You can notice that this one, I actually cut it, cook it directly on the cookie sheet, which you can do also. There is a certain sound to the bread when it comes out of the oven. You know, a certain sound that you recognize is cooked, it sound kind of hollow. And if you put a thermometer on it, I would have to leave it a minute for the temperature to rise up. That should get to between 200 and 210 degrees to be totally cooked inside. So what I want to do next is finish our soup, which you can see here. I did a soup here for actually double the amount of, uh, of people that I have in a recipe. The recipe is for four, and the soup is at least for eight or 10 here, as you can see. So I'm doing that part, which would be enough for four or six people for a whole meal. This is when we put our bread cut the bread and soak it into it on top. You want to cover the top, you know, with your bread. And I'm using here, I'm using the, the, the rye bread, which I love. So I'm wetting the whole top of it. Cheese, I'm using a Gruyere type of Swiss cheese on top to finish our garbure. Spread it on top. And now you want to put that directly into your broiler, not too close to the broiler, you know, but with the broiler about in the middle of the oven to get a nice, beautiful crust. This is going to cook for about 10, 12 minutes. And as you can see, I have half of it left over. That frees very well. You can enjoy it the week after. And now a fresh, light fruit dessert is what we need after that meal, all that bread. So what I have here is cantaloupe melon, which we'll put with a little bit of honey in there. That's to create a sauce, you know. In that sauce, we'll put a little bit of Grand Marnier. If you don't want to put the alcohol, you can do without. And then we're going to puree that into that uh, blender. And then take the core here. I've already cut the core of a pineapple. Start cutting it here. This is beautiful this way. I can cut, you want to cut that quite thin, you know, quarter of an inch to eight of an inch. This is really ripe, I can smell it also. And with this, we're going to put a garnish of red plum there. There we go, so again, cut them. It gives you, it's always interesting to take fruit with different color and do combination to put them together, you know, it's good. So what I would want to do here is to put the sauce directly on this. If I let that sauce time to rest, uh, the color would be a bit darker. And the reason is that I have a lot of air in it air with the emulsion which is created by uh, the food processor, you know, so you place those directly on top of it. You can mount a certain amount there, as much as you want, and then start 
decorating the outside with a little bit of those, those beautiful plums. So this is a very fresh, simple dessert. You can do all the type of combination of, uh, of the fruit, of course, but I mean, this would be perfectly fine this way. And now let's see if our soup is uh, ready. Our garbure, mm, beautiful under the broiler. This is, as you can see, beautiful, deep, rich color that you want to cut here. And this is, as I said before, really a meal in itself. You know, serving that whole, uh, that whole soup, you want a large portion of this and serve that as a main course. And now I'm ready for my rustic bread and my soup. And the first thing we're going to do is to bring a salad also because we always have a salad and some wine and of course the big basket of bread that we made today. Remember, bread is so satisfying. It is great to do it with the kid. The kid loves to kind of knit the dough and get involved into it. And believe me, the whole house smells so good when you make bread, the neighbors are going to come over. So if you've never made bread, you know, I try to clarify the technique for you. I hope I didn't do the opposite and confuse you. It was a bit complicated. Basically, it is simple. Flour, water, yeast, a bit of salt, and take your time, do the bread as I do at home, put it in a plastic at night, late afternoon, I let it prove slowly the whole night, and in the morning, mid-morning, I kind of mold the bread, let it prove a couple of hours, and it's ready. Early afternoon, it has to cool off for at least two to three hours, just ready for the night. Before I drink the aperitif, we start on the bread. And with the menu today, of course, starting with that beautiful, thick, heavy, satisfying soup that we have here, a green salad is always welcome and always goes so well with the soup. Finally, a refreshing dessert. And to go with that, we are going to have a wine from where the Garbure, the Garbure, the name of that soup, come from, which is the southwest of France, lower than Bordeaux, near the Basque area, a bit more center of France. There is certain interesting grapes in there, like the Tana, T-A-N-N-A-T, it's a different type of grape, and some Cabernet Sauvignon, a very earthy type of... Uh, earthy type of uh, wine that is going to go so well with the soup. And with that, of course, have your bread, have a piece of cheese in it, enjoy it. I'm sure that the kids are going to enjoy the bread. And remember, as I say, that bread can last five, six, up to longer, and it makes fantastic toast after. I enjoy making bread for you. Make bread with your family. Enjoy it. Happy cooking. <laughs>